So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after this rather short coffee break. We have a full program today. Uh, our next thing is a panel, and it's a panel on the next generation. We want to explore how millennials see the world, what their values are, and what they want to contribute to make a change. And the panel is moderated by Julia Valandina. She is um, consulting private families, companies, and governments in the field of impact investment. Thank you, Barbara. Good afternoon, or well, good morning, everyone. Sorry. Yesterday, we had an event um, for um, about 50, 60 CEOs. And we had a number of panels. And every speaker mentioned millennials in the way in a different way, but basically saying that millennials drive now how companies drive the behavior of companies, the behavior of consumers, and they are very important as a future of a workforce, have a future talent pool, a future solution makers. But they also are known through the press as being quite picky, quite flaky, very demanding. So today we're going to explore what is true and what is not true about millennials. We have a great panel. Uh, I start with uh, Tessie Nassau, Princess of uh, Luxembourg. Tessie is the director of Vice Impact. It is an issues-based uh, advocacy and social media platform um, targeted primarily millennials. You have been born in the ordinary family in Luxembourg. You um, went to army when you were eight, 18. Uh, joined the peacekeeping forces in um, Kosovo, where the only female officer there. Um, you're also a founder of Professors Without the Borders and uh, the ambassador of UNAIDS on women, and, uh, on women issues. Privately, you are an iron woman. You are actually <laughs> doing a lot of races with obstacles. And even though you are very afraid of flying, you just flew a plane a couple of days ago, flew herself. So on the other side, we had Zihan Lee. He's a social entrepreneur, born in Singapore, but working in Philippines now. He's the founder of Bagosphere, which is a social enterprise that tries to bridge the educational gap in uh, Philippines uh, and allow millions of youth, disadvantaged young people move out of poverty into professional employment. You are professionally uh, very engaged, but in your spare time, you like to cook curries, and you're also a trombone player. Next to uh, Zihan, we have uh, Natasha Müller. She's a third generation member of a business family, now managing her own family office. She's an active impact investor, uh, and also a very active philanthropist. Um, she's a true cosmopolitan, half Swiss, half Colombian, born and raised in uh, Japan and Hong Kong, living in uh, London, and you know, traveling all over the world. Privately, Natasha is a weightlifter. She can uh, deadlift 80 kilos and bench press 40. So beware, don't mess up with her. <laughs> And next to her, we have Tony Schwartz. He is uh, Greek-German, uh, also a member of the wealthy family. Um, he's the founder of Guerrilla Foundation, which funds and supports uh, grassroots movements. Um, also a very active uh, impact investor and movement builder. Uh, as a, given your uh, Greek roots, you're very passionate about bringing transparency into the political system in Greece, and you dream to become the next prime minister of Greece, and you're a passionate uh, skateboarder. So we have a very, very interesting panel today. So I would start with the three very quick questions to you, like blitz questions, which require just one sentence response. So first, we go around, I am passionate about... Relieving the suffering of others. Food systems, energy efficiency, and mental health awareness. Using all the levers that I have to create a positive social change. Woman empowerment and education. Uh, the issue I'm most concerned about the world is? 
Um, well, there's around 2,000 young girls, newly infected um, young girls with HIV every week. Tony? Um, the question that keeps me up at night is how our consumerist capitalist model is compatible with the ecological limits of the planet. You just stole my answer pretty much. <laughs> uh, it's um, basically what uh, worries me is uncontrollable growth under the current um, economic models of development and the way that they are overpowering our natural resources and um, the way that we produce and consume and uh, power our lives is just unsustainable and having a, a horrendous impact on the environment and causing wider social and uh, economic instability. Okay. What are the solutions to the world problems that you're most excited about? So I'm most worried about 400 million workers. Oh, I forgot. I forgot to ask you. Sorry. Okay. So, and then you go to the solution straight away. Yeah. So I'm worried about 400 million workers displaced um, and in need of new jobs by 2030 due to technology disruption. Um, and I think for solutions, um, I think we need to rethink education. Um, it's kind of like the boss thing to say right now, but you know, I think we need, we need to really look uh, into the, the models of education around the world. Um, and I believe that we need to make education much more responsive to the needs of the future of work. Much, much more responsive. I mean, education is like an elephant. It moves so slowly and we need more tools, uh, more ways to look at how can we connect uh, to the future of work. We need to, we need to help teachers teach better. Uh, instead of lecturing, we need to look at new models. Uh, and these are, these are, that's been out there, but uh, many teachers still teach it the old way. Um, and lastly, it would be about um, being bold. I think, we, I think solutions will come when we inspire others uh, to, to look at uh, more solutions and more people coming together. So we need to really think big. But as I said yesterday, it's not just about thinking big, but also to start small, um, to be really grounded. Um, and lastly, to learn fast. Uh, we need to have this beginner's mind. We, we can't know everything. And so if we think big, and we start small and we learn fast, I think we're going to find a lot of creative uh, solutions to the problems we have. Quick solution. Quick solutions. Quick. Uh, there are no quick solutions. <laughs> quick answers. Well, quick answer. Um, to quick <laughs> answers. I would say uh, 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 one important solution is to leverage um, and use the power of investors to support <clears throat> social entrepreneurs and drive financial capital, not just philanthropic capital, to solution drivers, because they are the ones that are going to innovate, create new technologies that are going to overcome some of the problems that we are currently experiencing. Tony? Well, I also agree there is no one solution, but if I had to pick one, I'd say um, an unprecedented mobilization of civil society unseen since the peace movement in the 70s and 80s. Jesse? Well, I think it is really it is about empower to empower. So I see, for example, the media as a tool to connect and to create transparency and, and yeah, raise the conversations. Right. So how is the millennial generation different from the previous generation? Natasha. Well, I said it yesterday, I'm going to stand by my point. We are fabulous, so uh, <laughs> you know, that's one way of, of differentiating us. But um, I would say that a big difference between us and previous generations is that we uh, grew up in the wake of the financial crisis, and we've both benefited and seen the negative impacts of global economic development. So on the one hand, we were highly educated, highly interconnected, very technologically aware, but at the same time, we've seen the impact that this is having on the environment. So for example, the proverb... Um, you know, the, that one that they say, oh, uh, uh, give a man a fish and he can feed himself for a day. Teach a man to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. That simply doesn't apply to millennials anymore because there are no fish left. Um, so I think millennials really want to live and, 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 and work in very different ways to previous generations. We want to buy products from companies that are accountable in their, and, and ethical in their business practices and to their consumers. Um, it's not just about financials. There's a whole other value system in place that's, that's driving us. Um, and so it's not just comes down to economic choices, you know. As you say, what me media outlet you watch has a statement, what food you what shops you buy your food from, what dietary requirements you have, your clothes you buy. These are all part of a bigger value system that we want to subscribe to. It's a beautiful one sentence response, Natasha. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything to add? <laughs> I, I, I would add to that actually with, with the fish as well. I, I think, you know, it's also to ask the questions, do they want a fish? 
Do they want fish? So I think the key word to the millenniums today that differentiates them from what we had before is disruption. So um, as someone said yesterday, if you want to change the industry, you need to disrupt it. And, and I think that is what millennials are doing now. Mm. Any additions? Tony, yeah? Uh, I might want to add that each generation changes the status quo in its own way. You know, our parents' generation um, challenged the status quo in their own way, and then they became the system. So it's a kind of a natural cycle, uh, which we kind of keep forgetting that it's, it's a renewal that happens all the time with a new generation coming in. Um, so I think, you know, um, if you actually look at your, your parents' past, you will discover that they were like us one day. So it's not like... Um, there, there's never been a generation that, that you know, challenged the status yeah. quo. So, Zian, my next question is to you. Um, research shows, and one of the research, um, they showed that 36% of millennials think that the purpose of business is to improve the society. Millennials are very excited about entrepreneurial, business-driven solutions to problems. And you're a good example. You founded Bagosphere, not as an NGO, but as a social business. Can you explain what's its business model and why have you chosen that form? Why do you think it's a more effective in tackling the problem that you are addressing? So Bagosphere is um, a program or a series of programs, an end-to-end -end approach to bring someone from poverty to transformational careers within a short period of time. Um, and in, in the whole context of the future of work, this is, this is uh, I think, a very uh, pressing issue. And we have, so we have a approach where we bring someone from zero, someone who's unemployed, underemployed, living in the below poverty line, uh, earning probably you know, in contractual uh, wage jobs, and we bring them to entry level jobs, but that's not enough. It's, it's bringing them from zero to entry level and entry level to professional careers or the middle management. And we're kind of in that space um, and doing all the work in the Philippines, uh, on the ground uh, in, in provin mostly provincial areas. And um, the business model is pretty, pretty simple. I mean, we, we shouldn't be too, think too complicated uh, business model. I think it's, it's very, very challenging. Um, so we, we charge tuition fees uh, to the students. Um, and, and they're relatively not, not cheap to the regular Filipino uh, countryside, uh, rural youth. Uh, we charge 350 US dollars. Um, but the, the insight that we had was, could we give ownership to the, to the young people instead of scholarships? And the catalyst to that was in um, kind of thinking about um, you know, different business models. Um, in the Philippines about four years ago, there was a scandal. It was a pork barrel scandal. That's when we started. And um, there were a lot of competitors in the space, uh, mostly NGOs um, and, and some private uh, organizations as well. Uh, and and they, they basically stopped their programs just because you know, they, they had no scholarships left. The government did not give them any more scholarships. So if we are really true to the to the spirit of trying to solve the problem of youth unemployment, we can't just say, you know, I'm going to stop for one year because there's no scholarships coming in from the government. Um, we got to find a way to, to continue to, to build on our organization. Um, and so we said, we need, to, we need to think differently. And so we decided to work with microfinance. Uh, students take a loan from a microfinance uh, NGO, which has, which has shared values with us. And the students pay back uh, the microfinance after they graduate over eight months. Um, and we've seen that the completion rate of programs are super high. Last year, we had a few hundred students, and we had a 99% completion rate. Uh, and I think that, that means a lot to young people who, are, who come from very disenfranchised backgrounds, uh, to, to say that they have completed a program um, where we see in, in traditional uh, tr vocational training programs dropouts to be as high as 60 to 70 percent. Um, so I, I think that's, that's how we think about how we can be um, achieving our mission. Um, you also work a lot with the future employers in trying yes. to understand, and I think that's also an innovative part of your model. Can you maybe expand on that? Yeah, so there's two parts to it. Very simple, there's the consumer side, which we engage with, with young people, and, and they pay institution fees. Um, that's just one model. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, we, we do scholarships as well. We do get um, working with government, but we, we have a tuition uh, fee model as well. Um, and, and so that's the consumer side. And then we have the enterprise side, which we recently developed last year um, to do more corporate training. But that's where we really engage employers to build from entry level to middle management. Um, we, we see that there is a lot of entry level uh, talent, but the minim, minimal manage, middle management gap is just so huge. Um, so where are the future leaders of society if we are not, help, we're not helping these entry level talent lead their teams and manage their teams better? Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Natasha, you and Tony represent wealth holders here, young millennial wealth holders. Um, we all know and he heard the statistics that there's a huge generational wealth transfer that's coming towards you. $56 trillion in the next 30 years just in the United States alone. Research also shows that your generation of millennials is very keen to align wealth with their values. It is very true for both of you who've aligned your portfolios, your wealth portfolios. You went up to a point where you separated, were willing to separate your wealth from your parents um, because they were not sharing your attitude towards this alignment. Why was it so important and how do you actually manage your wealth for impact? Um, I. I mean, I just want to say that it wasn't quite that my parents didn't or my family didn't buy into my values. It's those values were actually instilled in me from my family. So, I mean, part when I was still together with my family office, we, my first impact investment was in a solar park, and we did that as a family. Um, but it didn't go far enough, and so there was always kind of resistance to some ideas. Milk procurement companies in India, no, or education e-digital platforms in Indonesia, no, too risky. And it's a question of kind of the risk reward and the the I like your vision of where the where the world is going towards. Um, so I took the decision to separate from my family in uh, January 2016. And I basically set up my own um, structure. I set up my own investment vehicle. I set up my own investment committee. Um, I wrote an investment policy statement um, that directs kind of where we want to direct our capital towards, of which impact investment forms a core part. Then I chose four themes. Uh, impact themes that I that are close to my heart, like food, energy efficiency, affordable housing, um, bottom of the uh, base of the pyramid. Um, and it's important that I have my investment comedy because I get too excited by all the different themes that you can you can invest in. So they keep me kind of on the straight and narrow. Um, but I think the fact that people like Tony and I have separated our assets from our family uh, shows how important this value alignment is for us. Um, I mean, I, I, I come from a very close family, and I think you do too, and, but it's, this is too important for us, I think. Um, so yeah, so since then, I've basically been uh, populating my portfolio with impact investments. So for example, on the food supply system, I try to invest in companies that are working towards reducing inefficiencies in supply lines or connecting consumers and, uh, and producers uh, more directly, um, or companies that are using like innovative technologies to um, reduce waste packaging or to increase shelf life so um, you don't have to have them on the transport system as long as uh, you currently do. So, yeah. Fantastic, thanks. Tony, you're an active impact investor as well, and not only that you align your own portfolio, but you encourage other and help other millennials do that as well through support of the you know, Center for Sustainable Finance and Private Wealth and other organizations. But does it mean that now this obsession about financial performance, um, return on investment, and social impact, impact investment, does it mean that we don't need charities anymore? We don't need grants anymore? We don't need traditional foundations anymore? Mm -hmm. Is new models, business-driven models, pretty much substitute yeah. the need for the other forms? Yeah, I think first it's fair to say that in the business community and in, in the impact investing world, uh, NGO bashing is, is very much in, you know. Uh, business can solve all problems, government is the problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, leave it to business and, uh, and they will do the job. And I think what is emerging now more and more in the discourse is what Mr. Wufli said earlier, is that actually the institutions are a critical part of achieving the sustainable development goals. And so you need accountable, functioning institutions, the rule of law, etc. And I mean, I, uh, I live between Athens and, and Munich, and um, you know, part of the reason why Greece is in such a dire state is because we don't have functioning institutions. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the problem of institutions, um, business is part of this institutional problem because what is happening right now is that companies all over the world are funding politicians, are funding political parties uh, in the developed world, um, but also in the developing countries. You know, you have to grease a bit to make the machine work. And this, I think businesses are, are realizing now because it was the best practice for decades. They're actually realizing now with, with social media and, and this globalized society that we have right now that it is a huge liability 
And um, and the, I think this uh, the, the scandals that are popping up now everywhere, also with Facebook, uh, it's a wake up call. So you should really look into you know if you have a CSR department, look at what is happening um, in uh, in terms of like you know influencing politics because this is a topic that will really blow up in in your face literally. And um, and and I think companies should also be proactive about it. You know instead of waiting for the scandal to come, I think it might actually be better to come clean by yourself instead of waiting for the scandal to come. But my question is, what is the, what is the role of, you know, grant capital, philanthropic capital? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I got so sidetracked and here. Now you, it's but, <laughs> but the problem with, with uh, a bit with philanthropy is that, you know, we're focusing very much on the systems, uh, on the symptoms, and not on the root causes. And, um, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is really missing in the, in the grant-making space is more funding that goes to social movements and activists. I mean, I've tried out all kinds of philanthropy, you know, from social entrepreneurs to uh, refugee aid, etc. And what I found personally was uh, the most effective, um, which is very hard to measure, is, is supporting activists and, and social movements. You know, like um, uh, Martin Luther King also had to support himself somehow to be able to do his work, you know, and mm -hmm. there are very few foundations and philanthropists um, that, that are supporting this kind of work. And also there are too few progressive philanthropists that back uh, progressive movements. Like we need uh, the kind of people that counter the Mercers and the Blochers of this world, you know. Thanks. Tessie, you work for Vice Impact. Uh, it's a platform that reaches um, 300 million millennials per month. And the company not only provides content to those readers, but it also actually advises businesses on how to stay relevant to millennials. So what do you see the trends among the millennials? Are ordinary non-wealthy millennials as engaged as those you know, two representatives? What are the issues that are important for them? And how do they choose companies they support by consuming their products, companies they join to work at, and companies that work to, um, you know, engage on or against? Well, <clears throat> what is important to know, um, looking at millenniums today, um, there's 2.4 billion of them and growing. So in the next 10 years, 75% of the workforce will be millennials in any industry you will look at. Um, so what we found then at Vice, and that is why Vice Impact has merged, it is only in, for UK, Middle East and Africa, it's only three months old. So we have seen the trend that um, young people, it's not just enough to create content, but they want to have an, a call to, they want to have an action button. So Vice Impact emerged. So what does that mean then for young people, millennials, what do they want? So there's a statistics I like a lot that they did in the UK, a survey, where they uh, looked at millennials and 44%, what came out, 44% of these millennials thought that meaningful work that helps others was more important than a high salary. That was one finding of that, which was really interesting. And then the second finding was that 36% of these millennials, if they know that the business they're working in or the business they're getting engaged in is doing something good for society as well, they would work harder for it. So um, how can we then translate all of that? What we then for Vice found, so of course Vice is there to listen. We are, we are, um, we are a media company that, that doesn't want to just show but we want to really know what do they actually want, and that is why we have so many millenniums following us. So what we found then for the issues that millenniums really care about today is, um, well, women's rights, obviously, climate change, so recycling, renewable energies, and all of these other topics in the same category, and poverty. Really, it is also about wealth. Um, how can we give back? Uh, we are all privileged. Um, a lot of people are privileged, certainly the people who are in this room. And, um, you know, and how can we leverage this knowledge we have and create a platform for interaction of a connection? And so um, Vice then went back and offered uh, Vice Impact, which then companies came to us, as you said before, and they said, well, this is really interesting because young people, well, not only they, they follow what you're saying and, and it's so interesting, and it's really eye-opening and it's so transparent, but how can we remain relevant in all of this? There's so much information. And so we said, well, 
you know, we, we, we sit down with, with co companies and brands and governments and, and all kinds of people and say, well, this is your business plan. Every business plan, of course, business has driven societies from when we can imagine when business emerged. And that is good because we have come to where we are today because of business. Yes, of course, we have done it fast. So we have problems such as plastic pollution and others because everything has gone so fast. So now is the time to fine tune. So what we then did for, as an example, we have Evian, that is one of my newest projects that we have signed in Davos, where Evian came to us, and of course they are a very successful company, they, they, they are all over the world, but also they are one of the biggest plastic polluters in the world. And so they said, well, these are all of these, you reach so many millenniums, and as you said, in 10 years, 75% of these, they, they will be the workforce. These are our customers, these are our staff, that's our family, our children. What can we do? to change our business model, that it is sustainable, so we create revenue for us, we have salaries and we're doing profit, but at the same time doing good. And so we went back to them then what and said, well, here are the KPIs. Um, these are the companies you need to get invested with, and we tell the story. So what Vice is doing... What has Avian done? So, um, well, we have gone back then to them and said, well, of course, as a media company, we need to, uh, we cannot be biased. So there's a double-edged sword. There's a story to be told, good and bad. And so we said, well, if um, by 2025, we have these different KPIs, obviously, I cannot go into too much detail yet about it, but um, if, we, if we go with KPIs of recycling, for example, by 2025, and we follow your story, that means as well, uh, like if you look at it from a road perspective, with all of your bumps, so also the mistakes you do, we can tell that story and you agree with us and the content we create is created by us. And you cannot write it off and say, oh no, we don't like that now. But you there, there's, there's, a, there's a conversation to have and the story to be told. What you told me in our discussions, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, uh, I see it also a lot with the, with the millennials in the program we do in, in for, for High Net Worth Millennials, is that there is very low tolerance to the greenwashing. Yeah, well, the, as, as, as they say, the, the young people, they have a very incredible bullshit radar. Which, well, that is how we say that Vice. Vice is a little bit uh, more out there with their language. But it is really, you know, it, it, and it is exactly that. If you lie to them, if you hide things from them, they will find it and they will hunt you down. If it is not today, it is tomorrow. But that is, it's not to see as a threat. It is really to be seen as an opportunity. Right. It is as seen as an opportunity for change. Because... You know, if you can have young people understand what you're actually trying to do, we're all people, we have all our families, we all want to do good. Of course, we want to, do, we want to create revenue, we need to live from what we're doing. But at the same time, you know, everyone, every single person in this room cares about something, and so do the millenniums. And if we can... Right. No, go ahead. No, and if, yeah, and if, we can, if we can create a, a, a platform, which we are trying to create, of communication to speak between the brands, mm -hmm. governments, individuals and millenniums all together in one circle, it's a perfect combination for, for success. And I think that's a good finishing uh, thought that we can have. So my question to the three of you is, um, you know, we heard a lot about millennials, you know, being very vocal about... I mean, being aware of the problems, being very vocal and demanding the solutions. To which extent millennials are also offering the solutions and becoming part of a solution? And Zihan, I want you to maybe provide the perspective of the youth whom you are serving. So we spoke about wealthy, we spoke about, you know, non-wealthy but normal people. And so, you know, what are the disadvantaged youth thing? How are they the change makers? I think it would be a mistake to think that uh, you know a, a millennial. Um, I, would, I call I call a lot of the young people they work with are change makers. Um, that the change makers that we have um, here on stage and on the room, um, mistake to just think that you know to be a change maker you need to be out in the streets. You know you need to go on social media and you know and be really loud about things. Um, my perspective, working with youth, uh, disadvantaged youth in the countryside, uh, you know, and I've volunteered in Laos and Thailand, and I've seen my fair share of young people um, in, in, in those circumstances, um, is I think that a lot of the, the change making comes from within. And I think that's where the role of education is really important, because for all that I think society has, or, or aid or development and 
and solutions that we have traditionally uh, in the world has been focused on the outside. Um, I think now we're looking at inside um, and how, how do we change the, from the inside so that, so that we can have much more sustainable uh, ways of living um, and also for, for young people to thrive. Um, the, you know, the, uh, it, some of you might think that I'm a change maker, you know, I'm, I'm doing my thing and stuff like that, but really I think the, the, the real change makers are the young people that I work with. Um, I have an have a alumni, his name is Markel, and, and he, he led a really tough life. Um, and he, he told me once that, you know, Zihan, to earn this $100 a month to feed my family of four, you can never imagine how much pain and effort it took. He was drying rice uh, at 5 a.m. in the morning. He worked three jobs at a rice mill. And, and his son was sick. You know, he has no insurance. And so he's really living from, a, from, a, you know, from, from hand to mouth. And um, he, after joining a program and he, he got a job, he said, you know, I, I have saved enough. You know, that was this one year of working in a call center which enabled him to earn about three to five times more than what he used to earn. And so it was, that was dramatic. But after this one, one year, he said, I want to come to work for you because I now want to have that impact that I have to other people. And he recruited his first cousin, his wife, his <coughs> uncle, to come on board our program, that was just fantastic. And so, so he's now a recruitment officer at a company, and, and he's he's in his own way. Great. That's a great being example. being a change maker. Yeah, thank you, Tony. You're a bit more you know skeptical about millennials, or at least wealthy millennials, and you see the aspirational gap between what they say they want and what they do. Just quickly, because we need to open for questions. Sure, sure. I mean, there there have been studies on this as well that um, the overwhelming majority of millennials are interested in sustainable investing and aligning their values with their investments. But then actually um, about 10% pull the trigger and actually you know, start deploying capital uh, in this way. So there's a very strong cognitive dissonance, um, even in my generation, between you know, our values and, and our actions. And, um, and so you know, I'm, I'm sometimes a bit skeptical because I see a lot of excitement and a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, blah blah, but then you know have to translate that also into into actions. Sasha, do you agree? Not to, the, to that to that point to that extent. No, I'm a bit more positive. Um, I mean, I on the one hand, I fully agree with what Tessie's saying about the bullshit radar, and unfortunately for the previous generation, they're the victims of um, their own determination to get us super educated. So we can pierce through that that green veil, you know, and we can demand more. Um, but I think it's the power of our voice that is exactly what is so powerful about millennials and those. What Tony, what you were saying about the small change, I think those are the small changes that you can make and it, it's incremental, you know, little by little. So someone who wants to become vegetarian, for example, and stop eating meat, it creates a market signal. You talked about um, incentives. We're creating a new incentive structure with our demand, with our voice. And we're saying, this is what we want. This is how we think we should have it. This is the kind of world we want to live in. Look at the UK this morning. They're just set up a, um, a bottle deposit scheme, you know, because millennials or generations like us are worried about litter in the Thames. So we're pushing the government to do that and to work with private companies to come up with these solutions, which I think is great. Um, and even better than that, just to go back to a previous point about splitting up my assets from my family, we're also showing by doing. So, you know, I'm now investing in impact and my mom and my brother, and they kind of see where I'm going, they jump on board. And look at the next gen uh, um, Harvard course or the NIDA course that we're engaged in. These people, these people, these millennials, we want to do something. And somehow, you know, we want to change the world. We're not always entirely sure how, but we're trying to find the way to do that. And on that positive note, Tony, it has to be positive. That yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I mean, you know, you always, it's, it's always flashier to talk about the, the billionaires and the wealthy people deploying their money, etc. But what's, what's, uh, if you look at the financial flows, you know, most financial flows come from um, pension funds, institutional investors of all sorts. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, actually the, the, the money or like the capital of the, um, of the impact investors, they oftentimes, they're the trailblazers. But then actually, you know, the big uh, funds come from IFC, development finance institutions, etc. So I think oftentimes we exaggerate the, the importance of uh, private wealth owners and underestimate the power of, um, of you know, these 
big uh, financial tankers, uh, which you can uh, move, for example, through supporting activists. I totally disagree. In, I, I think we're not actually emphasizing enough the power of private capital of trailblazers. Yeah. Because not only that they are actually showing the way, they're creating the pipeline on which the institutional can actually uh, act because they have a lot of constraints and only by building those you know, social enterprises to the scale and to the level of investability can we actually enable those large institutions to act on those. But I just want to... Okay, can I maybe open. make one last point which is important <laughs> for me? Because I think what, what, uh, what, what also has to be said is, you know, that impact investing doesn't do with the problem of, of wealth inequality. You know, it doesn't matter if you have 100% uh, of your portfolio in sustainable stocks or in, in fossil fuels from an equality standpoint. So I think this is one dimension which is, uh, which is kind of uh, okay. left out of the discourse. Thanks. So we would like to take some questions from you. Other? Yes, please. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. I love millennials. I have three at home. Uh, it's not so easy. We tried to, uh, to bring them up with great values, yes. Um, they did everything. They're great. But on my side, they're also a little bit lazy. I come from education myself. I live in Singapore. I see the emerging markets. You're right. They're very eager. They want to succeed. Our millennials here in Switzerland, they're spoiled. I can't see them yet um, fulfilling their dreams. They want, yes. So I agree with Tony a little bit. I see the issues we have. My questions to you, and I still love the millennials, is how will you raise your children? What is the next generation going to be? Very good question. Who would like to take it? Well, we have someone here with children, so... <laughs> uh, well, yes, well, I have a 12-year-old okay. and an 11-year-old, so I'm getting into the millennium soon. And it is really, well, how I raise them, for example, to really, well, get engaged and everything. What I do is that, well, such as the audience here, my children are normally always in the audience with me. And I think it is also, yes, they, I wouldn't call millennials lazy. We had a discussion before. I think it is just because before generations before they almost needed to work themselves to death in order to build what is built now and that's fantastic but nowadays i think millenniums as well they also take into consideration well-being they take into consideration other factors which are important their own well-being so, excuse me their own well-being yes their own well-being exactly it's called work life balance they yeah, really can exactly. do that well mm -hmm. i fully agree <laughs> exactly but no but it is really um, but it is really, no, but they, they are able to juggle as well. I think through mediums such as technology, and that is where my angle is, and unfortunately I'm not into the finances, but as of the technology, it is easier because they can connect with each other. The, 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 the effects are faster, so you don't need to work I don't know how many um, hours a week as our parents did, because everything works so fast that the week today, Monday today last, and the next one will be so different because everything goes so fast, and millenniums are in the middle of it. And the, the, yeah, to use it as a catalyst. But, but what yeah. values yeah. you want to give your children? I mean, that's my question. Well, my values, personally, what I do is I engage them in everything I do. I take them everywhere I go. Right now, while they are, with, uh, they are with their father, it's his time to have them, so they're not here. But normally, even when I go to Dubai or wherever I go, where I work, what matters to me personally, I engage them. And I want them to understand that what I work in is important to me and should be important to them. I want to involve them as need soon to, as possible. to move slightly faster. Just quick Very quickly. Comment, yeah. if, if, if you evaluate a fish to climb a tree, the fish is going to be called lazy. You know, <laughs> Stephen, 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 Hawking, Stephen Hawking was called lazy by, you know, in, in his class. Um, and, and thousands of other intellectuals and creatives have been called different things. And so I think, you know, when we say someone is lazy, I think we're measuring by someone from a certain di dimension. I think it's very important to critically look at that. And because if, if someone else is really passionate about it, you know, there's no way you could really burn that. And, you know, it's, it's going to be so much more powerful to engage on that level. So I want to finish by asking the audience, who of you think the millennials are flaky, lazy, and more demanding than contributing? <laughs> Or, you know, I'm there. Cameraman. 
Okay. Well, who do you think that they need to work on uh, a lot of their issues and on you know being you know more contributing? Okay. Who think that they are powerful change makers and that everything will depend on them? <laughs> what are the others thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have to finish, unfortunately. Thank you very much for your question, and thank you very much for our panelists. Thank you.